All right, Alexander, let's do an update on what is going on in Ukraine. And things are going very, very bad for the Alensky regime and for the Ukraine military. Um, Bakhmut is down to like a building or two, if that. Uh, we have more Russian advances in other areas as well. And uh, it looks like the Russians hit a Patriot air defense systems. They, they launched a whole lot of missiles uh, the other day, uh, a lot of missiles in Kiev. And it looks like the, they targeted a, a Patriot air defense. And it looks like it's not been confirmed yet, but it does look like they, they hit that air defense system. And if there's one thing that uh, the Ukraine uh, military cannot spare, it is uh, air defense. So um, I guess it's lucky for Alensky that he was out of town. Convenient. It was convenient that Alensky was out of town because things are going very, very badly for, uh, for Ukraine. I agree. This was a very bad day, and it was a very bad day at multiple levels. I mean, first of all, the counterattack around Bakhmut, you know, the attempt to roll up the flanks. As far as I could see, it's now at a complete standstill. And in some places, it seems to be going into reverse. It's very difficult to get precise information. And we've always got to be careful because reports aren't always consistent. And there's some reports that suggest, you know, that the Ukrainians are still advancing. But the more reliable reports, and what I think are the more re reliable reports, say that that counterattack is now being countered, it's been pushed back in places, the flanks are not collapsing. By contrast, in Bakhmut itself, it's absolutely clear now that the Ukrainians are just holding on by their fingertips, their fingernails, to just a few buildings in the, in the west. We've actually had Prigozhin wandering around western Bakhmut, as he likes to do, uh, uh, showing off on his you know, helmet and flak jacket. And it must be said, coming under fire. So he's, you know, still a brave man. We have to say that about him too. We said some critical things. But whatever, it, it really does look now as if Bakhmut is almost, the whole saga of Bakhmut has almost ended. This has been a long drawn out, complicated, bitter story. But, I mean, it would be astonishing now, and anything, anything reversed then, I simply don't accept that. And in the meantime, as you rightly said, advances by the Russians in multiple other places. Apparently, they've re-established some kind of bridgehead west of the Oskol River. That's in the north. That's the area that they retreated from during the Kharkov Offensive. Not much information about that, but suggestive and interesting, and one wonders why they've done that, but anyway, they have. They've made more advances, apparently, in Avdeevka, which is this big place, this, this town that the Ukrainians control, which is close to Donetsk, and from where the Ukrainians have been um, bombarding Donetsk. It looks to me, from the map, as if Avdeevka is now very close to being fully surrounded. There's more reports just a short time ago, I saw them, that the Ukrainian troops are, are pulling out of what part of Marinka they still control. That might be a troop rotation. But again, the report suggests heavy Ukrainian losses there. But the big story is none of these things. It's about these enormous Russian missile strikes right across Ukraine and this particular offensive against Kiev. And as you rightly say, the Russians claim that they used a Kinjal missile, a hypersonic missile, and that it's destroyed a Patriot system. And that's not so far been, as far as I can see, denied. You know, maybe it will be, but I haven't seen any denials yet. And instead, we get stories that Ukraine shot down six Kinjal missiles. I don't think anybody believes that. And most... Concerning of all, even if the Patriot missile was not destroyed, Patriot system was not destroyed, there's a film circulating. I haven't seen it myself. I'm not good watching films, but they show 30 3 0 Patriot missiles being launched 
over the space of two minutes. Two minutes, $150 million worth of missiles expended. The United States only produces 250 of these missiles a year. Ukraine cannot afford to use missiles, Patriot missiles, at that level. So it does look as if the Ukrainians are running out of pretty much everything. And even if the Patriot missile system was not destroyed, uh, it will be rendered inoperable through overuse at this rate in a relatively short time. So a very bad day for Ukraine. Reports are that uh, that Alensky is returning back to, to Kiev uh, from his big European tour. And uh, what, what awaits Alensky when he returns to Kiev? I have to say one thing. All the videos that I've seen of his appearances, whether it was in Italy or Germany or France, he looks terrible. I mean, he looks absolutely worn out, terrible. I mean, it's, it's clear, it's crystal clear. Anyone that sees his videos understands that this guy is a complete wreck. Yes. So I don't know. I'm, I'm starting to think that, that uh, his return to Kiev is not going to, it's not going to be a, a happy homecoming for, uh, for Lensky. And uh, my suspicions are that, that he was much more comfortable, that he was probably happier outside of Europe, and he's dreading the, the moment that his, his plane lands in, in wherever it is in Poland and he gets driven to, to the capital of, uh, of Ukraine. What's Absolutely. your take on, on Alensky and his next moves? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I should add that there was this extraordinary video that came out a couple of days ago, I think before he went on his latest bout of travels, when he was still in Kiev, and he was addressing the Ukrainian people, and there was a white wall behind him, so no s sign of where he was. And j just watching that video, it was frankly disturbing. I mean, he looked all over the place. He, he did look dreadful, and I agree, he does look dreadful altogether. What awaits him when he gets back to Kiev? Grim news from every single part of the battlefronts. I mean, he's had the uh, ammunition dumps destroyed in all sorts of places. We've talked about Khmelnytsky. There was the previous one on Pavlograd. There have been others in all sorts of other places. He's seen Kiev pounded again. It's clear the Russians aren't running out of missiles. Remember all that story just a few weeks ago? Just about two weeks ago, they'd run out of missiles again, and now here they, here they are. They're back in action. More likely than not, they've destroyed a Patriot missile battery. The latest wonder weapon hasn't worked. They also, by the way, claim that they've shot down seven storm, uh, you know, storm shadow British missiles. Again, I can't corroborate this, but it's plausible. I mean, when the Russians say that they are shooting down HIMARS rockets, for example, the Americans now are admitting that that's in fact happening. So why shouldn't they be shooting down storm shadow missiles? So that wonder weapon doesn't look like it's looking as, working as well. And the HIMARS, sorry, the, the advance on Bakhmut by the Russians now seems to be inexorable. And Bakhmut is about to fall. Um, I've seen a suggestion this could be just five days away, perhaps even less, perhaps a bit more. Who's to say? Bad news on every front. I'm going to make a guess. I think you'll be looking for another foreign trip very quickly because, frankly, what awaits him in Kiev? Very, very bad news. A very difficult political situation, I suspect. One of the reasons, I suspect, one of the reasons he might be choosing to go abroad is not because he's afraid that the Russians are going to target him, but he may be afraid of risks, political risks, he might be facing in Kiev itself. So I, I don't know what Zelensky's going to do, but it wouldn't surprise me if he leaves Kiev very soon. And of course, he's already said that the counteroffensive has been postponed. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say the the same thing pretty much about uh, Alensky that I think is going to 
to be in another country uh, very, very soon. Sirsky failed in Bakhmut. Yes. So, he, you know, he wanted, he wanted to focus on Bakhmut because he doesn't want to get involved in, in any type of uh, offensive, spring offensive nonsense. So now what's Sirsky going to say? What's he's gonna, what is he going to do now? Uh, Zaluzhny. Where's Zaluzhny? Well, where is he's he? Disappeared. Exactly. He's disappeared. He said he exactly. was at a wedding and that's why he couldn't go to the NATO meeting because he was at his, had his buddy's wedding. Come on. Uh, th- things, are not, things are not right. No. Things are, are, are very, uh, very strange right now in, uh, in Kiev. And, and I, I'm starting to think that there was some sort of, of attempted plot or, or something going on. Uh, with the military, with Alensky connected to the offensive, something is going on, and um, we just don't know what that is yet. But no. I think uh, we're we're going to find out. Uh, what, what does Russia do now? Uh, well, they're they're going to well, they're going to take Bakhmut. They're going to take Avdiivka. Uh, they're they're firing on all on all cylinders, as as the expression says. I mean, they're they're obviously the momentum is is with them. Uh, they've got three, four, five hundred thousand uh, troops just there. They've got Wagner completing their goals in uh, in Bakhmut. Uh, they're not out of weapons. They're not out of missiles. They're not out of drones. They've got these glide bombs as well, which are causing all kinds of trouble for uh, for Alensky. And they're hitting all of Ukraine's weapons. Yes, all of Ukraine. So all all the money that the U.S. and EU taxpayers have given. To Ukraine for weapons, they've they're poof, they're gone. Well, to, they're gone. And Alensky was in Europe begging for more. Yeah, so I mean, one hundred and fifty-two million dollars of missiles lost in two minutes. Yeah. I mean, that that's that's thirty missiles fired. But, Some but, of them seen. Does Russia just play it cool? Back. Does Russia just play yeah, it cool? I think, and, I think so. And, and I just think, continue I, what they're doing, or do you or do you think they they have something else in mind? I don't know. I think for the moment the indications are that they intend to play it cool. But they might surprise us if things start to look like they're cracking on the fronts. You know, they might push, they might push harder. Apparently they have 300,000 men on the battlefields and 200,000 in reserve. That's the report that's, the reports that are circulating. They're building up their tank forces. They're building up their aviation they're, they're ready to make their moves, but what those moves will be and where they will come, I don't know. My guess is, this is just my own guess, is they're going to take Bakhmut over the next couple of days. I think that is now essentially a given. I mean, I can't imagine that they're not going to do it. And then I think they will want to secure the Bakhmut area. So we have these little places, Chasov Yar, Konstantinovka, Orekhov, Vasilyevka, Ivanivska, all the Bogdanovka, which we've been hearing so much about, they'll probably want to clear those in order to stabilize the situation around Bakhmut. I, I also suspect they will focus also on clearing things up in Avdeevka, as you said, and in the north around Siversk, perhaps Liman too, bringing themselves closer to Slavyansk, Kramatorsk. Now, the question is, do they then pause? Do they advance? Do they do something more ambitious? Apparently, the big tank armies, the Russian armoured forces, are concentrated in the north. Are they there to advance south or west? Who's to say? But for the moment, I think that the Russians will continue their grinding because it's working for them. War of attrition is working out well for them. Why should they change? Why should they change their strategy now? All right. What do you make of uh, Macron and Sunak's announcement? Sunak saying that they're going to be training uh, pilots. They're going to be giving uh, long-range drones. Uh, Macron the other day he said that he's going to be providing long-range missiles as well, and he says that the training of uh, Ukrainian pilots starts now. So uh, what do you make of, of, of these escalations from uh, Macron and Sunak? Oh, it's, it's, it's all, it's, I, I mean, I have always expected that sooner or later the Western powers will supply Western fighters to Ukraine. I mean, I, I, I don't, I've never had any doubt about that. Every single red line that the West sets itself, it eventually crosses. 
I mean, they didn't provide attack of missiles because there aren't that many of them, but they came up with Storm Shadow missiles uh, instead. But every single system that the West has provided to Ukraine has failed. Then none of them have achieved the decisive outcome that the West expected. So I don't know when these fighter jets will be provided. If they are provided, it will probably take months for them to appear on the battlefronts. By that time, the Russians will have strengthened even further and they'll be pushing further west towards the Dnieper. And again, I can't help but think that the reason the British and the French are talking in this way is because they're becoming increasingly nervous about the debate in Washington. Because note, it isn't the Americans who are providing this training, it's the British and the French are for Ukrainian pilots, but it's the Americans who are supposed to supply the aircraft. And the, there's clearly opposition in the US to supplying fighter jets to Ukraine from people within the US military. And uh, I also get the sense that the US military wants to see this thing wrapped up and ended as soon as possible. And the new command, the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's going to replace Millie in a few weeks, um, General Brown, apparently absolutely wants that. So it's unsurprising that Macron and uh, Sunak are talking in this way. They both overcommitted themselves to supporting Ukraine. And always probably they're hoping that something that there'll be some new weapon that they can supply to Ukraine that will change the direction of the war. It never does. And in the meantime, they disarm themselves further. And um, today, this morning, I was reading in the Financial Times that Russian oil supplies, oil exports are now at record levels. They've surpassed their levels of 2021 and 2022. Don't, don't worry about it. Uh, an 11th sanctions package will no, <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll do the trick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, one final question. Uh, what, what effect will the elections have, the U.S. elections have uh, from this point forward? Not for Trump. We already know Trump's position on Ukraine. He's made it clear. He would, he would end the war in 24 hours. We all know how he, he would end the war. He would just do the same thing he did with uh, IS, which is he would yeah. stop funding Ukraine like he stopped funding IS. And everyone knows that in 24 hours, the war would be over. That's all Trump would do. He wouldn't be calling Putin and, and Delensky and doing all these complicated things. Just yeah. like he handled IS in, in, uh, in the Middle East and he stopped funding them. Obama was funding them. He stopped the, the money flow. He would do the same to Ukraine and the war would be over. But Biden, my question to you is yes. Biden. Yes. Biden is all in. He's yes. bogged down. He's been fully committed to Ukraine. His entire yes. foreign policy is based on Ukraine. But what if, what if as the election gears up and Biden starts campaigning from his basement and they realize from the polling numbers that even, even his supporters, even his hardcore supporters are not hot on Ukraine, what happens? Well, that's an excellent question. I'm going to say what I think is going to happen. I think they will escalate. I, I, I think that um, the uh, blinken Newland axis will definitely want to escalate. And I think that is... Biden's own inclination as well. Bear in mind, he is now colossally committed to Ukraine. If, as I firmly believe, Seymour Hersh's story about the blowing up of Nord Stream is true, that Biden was personally directly involved, then he's got a personal reason for wanting this thing to end in some kind of victory or at least for it to continue beyond the election. <laughs> because he doesn't want people asking questions about that particular event, because it would be potentially catastrophic to him. So if the opinion polls in the US turn strongly against the war, I think that he will try to do the very thing that Lyndon Johnson did 
in the early months of 1968, which is escalate. That's what Johnson's immediate instinct was to do in Vietnam. In the, Johnson was stopped and had to step down and announce that he wasn't going to stand again for president. I, I don't think Biden has that option. I don't think he'd simply stand down now. I think his instinct, his gut instinct, will be to try to escalate and hope that something will turn out. Uh, my my thought on this, and I don't know what you think, is if I were if I were advising Biden on this, I would say that he either has to drop Ukraine now, yes, be done with it before the election really starts up, so that whatever damage comes to him. He takes it, he eats it for the next month, and then it fades into memory. So either stop it now and just take the hit that you're going to get, and that's fine because in a month or two, you know, the, the voters will forget about it and you can move on to other things. Or if he sticks with Ukraine for the next month or two and continues to, to go down this path, then yeah, he's going to have to go all in because he won't yes. be able to pull out because he'll be knee deep in the, in the election cycle. I completely agree with that. By the way, I'm pretty sure that there are people, professional people within the Democratic Party who are anxious about the election next year, who are telling Biden and his team exactly that. And notice that Jake Sullivan, who's the man who's closest to the election, um, running elections, I mean, that's his background, basically. Um, apparently, he also now is starting to wobble. He's talking about... Uh, negotiations and things of that kind. So there is, I'm sure, that advice being given to Biden. And I think once upon a time, the Biden of 10 years ago might have listened to that advice. I mean, in those days, he still had, you know, all his faculties, if I can put it like that. He had the flexibility and the political instincts to understand that he needed to pull back. I don't think he has that anymore, though. That's the trouble. I think he has the stubbornness and the inability, the inflexibility that comes with his age. So I think he's going to escalate. It's going to escalate. All right. We'll uh, leave it there. Is there anything else that we need to discuss? Well, or well we I, I, I think that once the full implications of what have happened has, has happened over the last... 24 hours, and perhaps the last week, because by some calculations, Ukraine has suffered heavier losses over the last week on the battlefronts, specifically in Bakhmut, than it has done at any other point in the war. Now, I, I want to stress these are calculations. They're not based on really confirmed data. We don't actually have much data. But as I say, it, it, if you put all the pieces together, and if the situation is, every, is as grave as it looks, which I believe it is, then, as I said, I think that the more that sinks in, the more the mood in Europe and in Washington especially is going to darken. And we're going to start to see a real push and argument about what to do. Yeah. You, know, you can see that Alensky is cracking. He's cracking. And sometimes I think that, that Sunak's hug of Alensky was, was less of a friendship hug and more of a, of a you know, um, it's been nice knowing you kind of, kind of hug, more of a goodbye hug. I don't know. Quite likely. Very uh, likely. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll uh, leave it there. TheDuran.Locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. And go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.